First Corinthians chapter nine. So as you know, we're in our, our series of the law of Christ. And going over this today, there is a lot of content that I want to cover tonight, but we'll cover just as much as the Lord has us cover. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse 19. Now, if you remember, this is the chapter and verse that we went to last week. Chapter 9, 1 Corinthians, verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. You see that? That I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Father, thank you for all the treasures that we have in Christ. Lord, tonight, may we just open our hearts and minds that you may teach us through your Holy Spirit, where you be glorified forever and ever. Father, thank you for your gift of grace to us. May we just glean from your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we look at the law of Christ, I was going to step back and think about this kind of objectively in a big view. If, if you remember, I don't know if you still have your outlines, but one of the three main divisions that I wanted to bring out, and um, Charles Leiter was a man that wrote the book, The Law of Christ, and I'm kind of using his outlines and how he discusses things. And it's just a lot of treasure in here when we start talking about the law of Christ. What does that mean? What, is it, what does the law of Christ mean? And did you know as believers that we are under the law of Christ? We're no longer under the law. We're no longer outside of law. As, as Paul had laid out these three different categories, Paul says, I'm not under the law. To the Jew, I became as a Jew, as one under the law. So he could gain some. That meant that he uh, did not want to unnecessarily offend the Jews. And then without the law, he was describing the Gentiles because we see that the Gentiles were not under the Mosaic law. So when he's talking about the law, he's talking about the Mosaic law, the law of works, which were given at Sinai. The Gentiles were never at Sinai. We were never at Sinai, but we had a law unto ourselves. Right? That's what Romans chapter 2 says. And that law that God has given all people, they use to accuse or excuse their behavior. So we see uh, morality all throughout the planet, all through all time, even those who were not given the Ten Commandments at Sinai. Paul says, I'm not underneath any of those. I'm underneath the law of Christ. So when you step back and you start saying, okay, as a Christian, I, I want to learn what this is. I, and I, I want to come under the standard which Jesus had given. I mean, all you have to do to know the law of Christ is read the New Testament. And then you can find out what the law of Christ is. But what also helps is being able to place the different laws, the different covenants, throughout history. What was God's plan from the beginning? And so as we start looking, we're looking at the, uh, the redemption in history as a category today. Um, I do have one correction for the outline to give you, uh, but I'll talk about that here in a minute. But really the concept of the Bible, when you pick up the Bible, it is meant to be read from the beginning to the end. And in the Bible, you will see God's revelation. You will see all through history. This is history. Do you know we have day one in the Bible? And then all, all the way up until the, the, the finishing of the revelation. 
Um, you know, I've, sometimes it's my pet peeve to, to hear somebody talk about prehistoric times. I'm like, there are no such things. as what, what they mean is history before history was written. So they'll say prehistoric times. Before there was somebody there saying, oh, okay, the dinosaur ate this fruit today. And before there was time where man wrote history, so they'll say, oh, it's prehistoric time. But I do not agree with that term because we do have history from day one. You can't get any more prehistory than that, right? I mean, you can't get any more history than that. That's day one, all the way up until. So God's revelation through time, what we do is we pick up the word of God and we see that there has always been a purpose and a plan of God through all of time to redeem his elect through Jesus Christ. Always. That's always been the plan before the foundation of the world was even laid. That his redeeming purposes and that his elect would all be saved by Jesus Christ and through the redemption of Jesus Christ. So we see that we have a freedom from the law through the word of God. We are no longer under condemnation. That is the second category, freed from the law. And then now we are under Christ. So through the redemption of time, the, the flow of redemptive history, we see God's saving purpose in Jesus Christ has always been the underlying and the tying together of all the covenants which we see in the Bible. It's always been that. So let's uh, turn over to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 is going to be where we mainly are tonight. So the first thing that we really want to talk about, and we won't read Galatians 3 right away, but the first thing we want to talk about is what Paul meant by he's not under the law, and what does the law of Christ say? Well, the first thing we know about the law of Christ is it is not the law of Moses. The law of Christ is not the law of of Moses. Paul makes this very clear. The New Testament makes it very clear all throughout that we as God's people, or as Christians, are no longer under the law. And so born again believers, Christians, are not under the law of Moses anymore. And we have several scriptures that tie into that. And uh, just to give you a few, there's Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Paul says, Brethren, ye also have become dead to the law, wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit. Uh, Romans chapter, or I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. That Jesus, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, making peace. Galatians 2.19, Paul says, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, and we'll see this more, that the law was a schoolmaster. And to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now, as we start looking through the flow of time, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to start looking at the flow of redemptive history. We're going to start with the Old Covenant and the establishment of the Old Covenant. Now, you know, one of the things I was thinking about, and I don't want to get too far off on this, but a lot of the people, they mistake the Old Covenant that God had said that, you know, here is the new and therefore the old is old. Well, the Old Covenant refers to the Mosaic Law. It, rever it refers to the covenant of works, the covenant made there at Mount Sinai. You know, in the Old Testament, that's just one piece of history. The Old Testament, you know, it, it, not everything in the Old Testament is old. What about the, the Noahic covenant? What about the covenant God made with Noah? That's still going, isn't it? I mean, I mean, we see reminders of that all the time. What about the Abraham covenant? That's still going on. That's fulfilled in Christ. And so, you know, I, you know to, if I had my druthers, it, we would call the Old Testament before Christ and then the New Testament after Christ, you know, because that's really the division. So the Old Covenant is in the Old Testament. 
but it is in a period of time in Israel's history. You have Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And what do we see about this Mosaic covenant? The covenant of Moses. Well, it was at Mount Sinai. We saw the writer of Hebrews describe the scene. And in Exodus, it described the scene as the, the, the mountain was sanctified. Nobody could touch the mountain. And God spoke in thunderings and lightnings. And there was a thick cloud. And it showed the holiness of God. Even the, the law which God gave to Israel said, in Exodus chapter 20 that it was written by the finger of God. So the law is holy and just and good. There's nothing wrong with the law. There's no shortcomings. The shortcomings belong to us, not the law which God gave. So the law was given by God, as we know, uh, through the angels to Moses as the mediator of the old covenant. So we see that it was written by God. In addition to the Ten Commandments that, that you all know about, there were, I mean, you all have heard of the Talmud. I don't know if you've heard of the Talmud. That actually includes the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of Moses. Some call it the Pentateuch. But the Torah is the written law. The Talmud is the, not only the the law spoken by the rabbis, but also the interpretation of the Torah. So the Talmud <laughs> contains 613 commandments. And we see many of, I mean, actually, the, the spoken law and the spoken interpretation of the written law said that these 613 commandments are in the Torah, the written law. So we see more than just the Ten Commandments. Uh, some people divide it between three, the civil, ceremonial, and moral. Now, one of the things that we see about the Ten Commandments, that it was, it sanctified the nation of Israel amongst all the other nations of the world. Israel had an advantage of having the law, of having God's protection, of having God's uh, oracles, that's what Paul says, what advantage then hath the Jew? In Romans chapter 3, verse 1, much chiefly in every way, much because they had the oracles of God committed unto them. Uh, in several places in the Old Testament, we see the benefits that God gave them for having the law. In Deuteronomy 4, 7, it says, For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for. And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? So in the New Testament, when Paul is, is preaching, we're no longer under that law and that the old covenant has been replaced by the new covenant. They hated Paul. They thought it was blasphemous what Paul was saying, that the Messiah was actually going to be crucified. That's contradiction in terms right there. The, the Jew thought of the Messiah as the conquering king that would come and, and that would relieve them from the heel of Rome. That how could the Messiah come and be crucified? How can the Messiah come and be cursed? Cursed is everyone who hangeth upon a tree. And, you know, as Paul, as we know, was saved of the road of Damascus, and he saw the risen Lord, he saw risen Jesus. Boy, and then the Lord saved him and showed him. And then things started clicking for Paul in regards to who Messiah ought to be. And then one of the things that he realized in Isaiah, and I love this, is that Christ did not become the cursed. Christ was not the cursed. The Messiah was not cursed. The Messiah took on our curse. He took on our curse that we may be set free. That's who Messiah was to be. And then the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all in Isaiah 55 and Isaiah 53. So God, so Jesus, the Messiah, he became cursed. He became cursed of God himself for us. And so you, you can imagine, I mean, but if, if you're an unbelieving Jew and you're still holding on to the law and all of the statutes and, and you believe that this is the God-ordained way of life, then you would have been, 
you would have hated Paul. Paul said that we're no longer under the law and that that covenant at Mount Sinai has been replaced with a new covenant. Well, talking about the new covenant. So 800 years after Mount Sinai, 800 years, God raised up a man named Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, God prophesied of a new covenant that would come. Uh, you don't have to turn there. I'll just read you a couple of what it says. There's four main categories. Here was the new, prov uh, the, the, the new covenant prophecy. This was going to be 600 years before Christ came. Jeremiah 31, 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, which my covenant they break. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write in their heart and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. From the least of them and to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. That law written on the heart and the, how the fact of the new covenant, there is going to be no more teach your neighbor to know the Lord because all shall know me to the least to the greatest. Who? Those under the new covenant. Those, the believers. Now in the Old Testament as a Jew, if you could have been in the Mosaic economy, you could have been a good Jew and not know the Lord. You could have been a, new, a, a really good Jew. You're, you're doing the sacrifices. You're, you're keeping everything. But you have a heart as cold as stone towards the Lord. And so your neighbor or, or your family would say, know the Lord. You're, you're doing all of the, the rituals and, and everything. You're doing all of that. And your sacrifices are great, but you don't know the Lord. Under the new covenant... So you could be a covenantal uh, Israelite and not know the Lord, but not in the new covenant. The Lord will make his abode in you, in each and every person. You will not have to, to teach another believer to know the Lord. Because if they're a believer, they know the Lord because the Lord is in them. And so that's the blessing of the new covenant that's coming. And not only that, he says, there's sins and iniquities. Well, I remember no more. So the, the prophesy of Jeremiah of the new covenant was 600 years before Christ would come. Now we know Moses ushered in the old covenant and, and it, Moses was the mediator of the law and what we're getting ready to read. But how did Jesus usher in the new covenant? Well, it was a small upper room and there he gathered his disciples and he held, held out a cup and he said, this is the cup of the New Testament of my blood. Drink you all of it. Jesus ushered in the new covenant. Right there, he inaugurated the new covenant and then he ratified and he sealed the new covenant with his blood. And so we see as we're going through time what's going on. We see the old covenant, we see the new covenant, and the view of that redemptive history that we see. Now, what about the Abraham covenant? All right, so there's going to be a lot of verses here in Galatians chapter 3. Look at verse 15. We're going to read the rest of the way. I believe this is going to be a really good study for you all. Now, what about Abraham and Christ? Galatians chapter 3, verse 15. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if he be confirmed, no man disannulleth or added thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not in two seeds, as of many, but as of, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of... Now, do you all understand what, what it says so far? That the law that was given 430 years after God gave promise to Abraham, nothing in the law 
can make anything in the promise God made to Abraham, it cannot affect it. Okay, so, verse 18, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. What inheritance? The promises God gave Abraham. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come. Now who's the seed? The seed is Christ. He's already identified who the seed is. Its seed is Jesus. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And we'll get to that here in a minute, but notice that. Who are the promises to Abraham made to? The seed. Who's the seed? Jesus Christ. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which afterwards should be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Now there was a whole lot of information that was just given to us right there, and we're going to go through here, and if you ever want to understand the covenant given to Abraham, then Galatians chapter 3 is a beautiful chapter to come to. First, in redemptive history, now coming back to that overall subject, God reveals the very foundational principles of salvation in the Abraham covenant. That's why Paul is always returning back to Abraham when he's talking about and teaching the gospel. He's not going back to the Mosaic Covenant and teaching the gospel. He's going back to the Abrahamic Covenant and teaching the gospel. Well, he uses Abraham as an example in Romans chapter 4. We see that Paul is saying that to prove that justification by faith alone without works, it is the same faith which Abraham had. And we see that in Genesis where it says Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for Righteousness. What did Abraham do? He had faith. How was Abraham saved? By faith. That's the principles of the, do of the gospel. It's by grace through faith. So Paul goes back to the Abraham covenant. He doesn't go to the old covenant. He goes back to the Abrahamic covenant. And actually, as a matter of fact, he says, you know what? Here's the Abrahamic covenant. Here's the promises of God. It's the spiritual. It is, this is grace by faith or Faith, grace through faith, and the law, the old covenant, cannot disannul it, cannot cancel it out. We can't add to the covenant which God gave to Abraham. Paul goes and says, you know what, circumcision had nothing to do with God justifying Abraham. If circumcision defines, if circumcision in the flesh defines who a Jew is, well, circumcision of the heart defines who one of God's children are. It was Abraham's faith that should be the pattern to follow, whether you're Jew or Gentile. The basic argument of Galatians chapter 3 that we just read is because God's covenant with Abraham was hundreds of years before the Mosaic covenant. It was way before the law. Then the law cannot disannul. The fulfillment of the, the Abrahamic covenant cannot depend in any way on the conditions that are stated in the law. The fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham do not depend on anything stated in the law. Because the covenant was given by promise to Abraham. Well, Looking at the Abrahamic covenant, we know it's in Genesis chapter 15. I know I'm going fast, and there's a lot of places that we could turn and look at. 
Uh, but hopefully I'm not going too fast. You can't write things down. God's covenant to Abraham was based on promises that God would keep himself. Genesis 15, verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now towards the heaven and tell the stars if thou art able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it for, to him for righteousness. God made promises to Abraham. Now, what, what are these promises? Well, we're going to talk about four. There is seed, nation, land, and promises. The promises that, that are blessings. The, the promises which God gave to Abraham. You can kind of... Um, the seed. Well, let's look at what he promised in Genesis 17, 19. He says, Abraham, I, uh, Sarah's going to have a son. And you will call him Isaac. So there was the promise of a seed. Abraham, uh, Sarah had not had a child. But God promised Abraham a seed. He also promised Abraham a nation would come. And who did this nation end up being out of Abraham? It ended up being Israel, right? Abraham's the father of Israel. He also promised him land in Genesis chapter 13, verse 14. Well, we all know that that physical promise was about the land of Canaan, right? The promised land. And he told Abraham, look, where, look from where you are. Look north, look south, look east, look west. All the land which you see, I will give it to you and your seed. Well, God also promised Abraham blessings. And we see the blessings of God given to Abraham. We see protection that he gave Israel and all the seed, the physical seed. God gave him benefits and riches. And he gave many long lives. And he said, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Now, if you were just to stop there and never read the New Testament, what would your conclusion be. Wow. Go Abraham. Wow. I mean, those are some great promises. And wouldn't it be wonderful to be in the nation of Israel? Wouldn't it be wonderful to be one of Abraham's physical descendants? Look at all these promises. But what do we see in the New Testament? When you start reading the New Testament, there's a spiritual reality in the New Testament of, Ab of the Abraham covenant. How rich and how deep it goes. Now take those same four things. Seed. God promised Abraham a seed. Well, what did we just read? Who is this seed? In verse 16. Now to uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Christ is the one who would finally inherit all things. God's promise to Abraham was ultimately God's promise to Jesus Christ. God's promise to Abraham spiritually, and Christ fulfilled it, he's the seed to which the promises are made of God. Christ is the one whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And because we are in Christ, we have become heirs to the promise, the promises to Abraham. We may not be a physical seed of Abraham, but we sure are a spiritual one. How is that? Because Jesus is the seed of Abraham and we're in Christ. So we have received the promises made to Abraham. So that's the seed that we see. We see it just explode in the New Testament with just rich, rich meaning. Well, what about the nation? Well, what about the nation promise? When God showed Abraham all the stars in the sky and the number, that meant much something much more greater than Abraham's physical descendants. 
It says in Genesis 22, 17, that in blessing I will bless thee and multiply. I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the shore. In thy seed all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Well, what do we see in Revelation chapter 7? What do we see in glory? Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 describes this as the people of God in glory. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and all kindreds and all people and all tongues stood before the throne before the Lamb of God. The ultimate fulfillment of this promise that he gave, I'll make you a great nation, is the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of his saints. Aren't we? That's what it calls us. It calls us a nation. The believers of God, those who are in Christ, were called a nation. Jesus even stated this in his parable of the wicked husbandmen. And he says, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to another nation. Who's this nation? It's the spiritual one. It's the children of God. It's those who are in Christ. Peter, and, and we're, you know, in, in First Peter in Sunday school, he calls believers a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. The believers, all the believers, are considered a nation. It's a spiritual nation. And he says, I will make you a great nation. Well, what about the land? He promised Abraham land. We saw from Hebrews how even when Abraham was on the land, he still looked for a better country. He was standing in the promised land. It's what it said in Hebrews 11, chapter, 9, or chapter 11, verse 9. By faith, he, so, he sojourned in the land of promise. Abraham was standing in the land of promise as in a strange country. It was home away from home. He was even standing in this physical fulfillment. He was dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. He looked for a city which foundations and whose builder and maker is God. Abraham had stepped foot in the land that was promised to him, but he still looked for that new land. And that land that is coming, isn't it the new heavens and the new earth? What about the blessings? And I love this. The blessings that we see, you know, Abraham, or God had given promise to Abraham about the blessings. What are the real blessings in Christ? How do the New Testament writers, how do they describe us as being blessed? How are the blessings fulfilled in Christ? They describe us being blessed as those who have been imputed the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We're justified by faith and all of the glorious benefits that come with declaring the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We're blessed. In Acts, when Peter was preaching to the Jews, Acts chapter 3, verse 25, he's, he equates the blessing of God as this, God raised up Jesus and sent and blessed them by turning them away from their evil ways. Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, In thee all nations shall be blessed. So then they which are of the faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. The true blessings promised to Abraham and his seed was justification by faith, by faith alone. Jesus took our curse. He shed his blood so that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. David calls the man whom the Lord does not impute sin as blessed. Have we received the, the blessings that God promised to Abraham? Yes, we have. How have we received those blessings? By Christ's precious blood being shed for us that we are no longer under the condemnation and the curse of the law. Jesus becoming the curse for us, paying the penalty for our sins. 
Isn't that a blessing? Isn't it a blessing that our name's written in, in the Lamb's book of life, all upon the precious blood of Jesus and his sacrifice? Oh, the, the righteousness which has been provided through Jesus Christ is a blessing, and it's not just to the Jew. It's to the Gentile. All nations of the world will be blessed. Every kindred, every kind, every tongue. If you take those four blessings, and so do you see what we've done? We've taken the New Testament, and we have read what it says, and how the blessings that God had given to Abraham, we see a spiritual reality of those blessings to us. Um, of course, we, we ran out of time. Um, well, I might have to have a part two, of course, of this, because I want to keep going. Because through the, under the, remember, we are still talking about redemptive history. The flow through time. How we see God working this out. Uh, there's three major divisions in the flow through time. And I love it. We'll, we'll go over that next week. But if you study ahead or you read ahead, those three divisions, and it's actually on your outline, are promise, law, and then faith. Promise was given in the Abraham covenant, right? This promise was unconditional. It was immutable, and God's promises are certain. When, when was that given? Well, that was in the year 2000 B.C. So I don't know if you all look at Yeah, okay. So here's Abraham at 2000 B.C. God gives the promise to Abraham. Well, then comes along law some 500 years after, in 1500 B.C., comes the Mosaic Covenant. And then, 1,500 years after that, comes Christ and the New Covenant. You have promise, law, faith. If you take those three, and you take the whole Bible, you can conceptualize it in those three categories. Now, here's the interesting question. We see Christ fulfill the Abraham Covenant. Christ is the seed, and those in Christ. Well, what about law? Why did God put law after the promise. Why, why put the law right there in the middle between Christ fulfilling the Abraham promise? And we're going to see that. And he discusses that in Galatians chapter 3. Why was the law added? I don't know. Hopefully you go home and, and figure that out. Why was the law added? Oh, wasn't the law added just to show us how unholy and unworthy we are, and how, fall, how far we've fallen short of the holy God. Yes, yes it has. It really has. It has brought into sharper focus just how God sees us and how fallen, how short we have fallen. Um, just real quick, I want to give you uh, on that outline where it says the letter C, if you have it, the Mosaic Covenant, well, above that, put the Abrahamic covenant. So uh, I had forgotten to put that in there. With the same exact scripture, Galatians, so it goes Old Covenant, New Covenant, Abraham and Christ, and the Mosaic covenant, or the Abrahamic covenant, Galatians 3, 21 through 25, and then the Mosaic covenant. I'm not sure how I missed that, so I apologize for that. But let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, again for this day. Thank you, Father, for... How great your salvation is, Father, and how we should exalt Christ and how you have exalted Christ and how we find all fullness in him all through your time that you have created, all through history, which you have providentially directed, how all things find purpose, fulfillment, meaning in Jesus Christ. Father, may we praise you for just your unspeakable gift. Lord, help us, Father, as we leave this place. Be with us all in, in a special way that we just desire to bring you glory in our lives. Careful what we say. Careful what we do. And that we uh, yield to you 
and we are directed and guided in all humility by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we'll give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.